In most every community across the nation, there is the Telecommunications Central Office. They are often located in the center of town and well known to the locals as to its function. This story is about AT&T's hidden central offices, the COs that the public did not know about and that played a crucial role in our nation's national security. During the Cold War era between the United States and Russia, there was one thing on everyone's mind surviving a nuclear attack. AT&T and the government recognized it was crucial that telecommunications continued during a nuclear war. In the mid-1960s, AT&T began a program to build hardened central offices that could withstand a nuclear attack and the accompanying electromagnetic pulse, or EMP. An EMP has the ability to disable all electronic equipment. This plan was called Operation Survival. These nuclear-hardened COs would handle AT&T's long-distance L4 carrier communications, communications for the U.S. military's Audubon network, and at times for the President's Air Force One communications. AT&T began working with government agencies and local construction contractors to build a series of remote sites across the nation from coast to coast. The basic building criteria was established by the United States Army with input by the American Society of Civil Engineers. The general telecommunications specifications were developed after research by Bell Telephone Laboratories and the University of Illinois. Western Electric, the manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell system, built and installed the telecommunications equipment. At the time, it was determined the targeting accuracy of nuclear weapons was only two miles. All underground hardened AT&T sites were designed to withstand an explosion of a 20 megaton nuclear warhead no closer than two miles away. These sites could not withstand a direct ground zero hit. They were also designed to withstand an overpressure of 50 psi. This overpressure consisting of both heat and shock is what destroys most structures. To put this in perspective, an average wood frame home would be totally destroyed with an overpressure of one half PSI. The overpressure blast detectors automatically activated multi-ton blast doors to the bunkers. These doors were nine inches thick and resembled bank vault doors. Many false alarms occurred when nearby lightning strikes activated the overpressure systems. Every site was equipped with gamma ray radiation monitors to detect nuclear explosions. If an explosion was detected within a radius of 250 miles, a site would instantly go into lockdown status. About 25 hardened sites were built across the nation, as well as about 20 semi-hardened sites. The construction costs of each site varied from 20 to $40 million each. The size of the underground sites varied from one to two stories and from 10,000 to 40,000 square feet of space. Most were built in remote locations far away from populated areas. Average construction time took over a year. The walls were one foot thick and reinforced with over 2,000 tons of rebar and used over 10,000 cubic yards of concrete. The infrastructure had to withstand the shock and seismic movement of a nuclear explosion. Almost all critical infrastructure equipment was mounted on springs. The electrical panels light fixtures, diesel generators, HVAC cooling equipment, telecommunication equipment, batteries, and even the toilets were all mounted on springs. The entire building was shielded with copper mesh to prevent the damaging effects of an EMP pulse. When the building was completed, it was buried with five feet of compacted topsoil. There was only the above microwave tower and a couple of small access buildings visible from above. In their prime, these facilities were manned 24-7 by management and craft personnel. To enter the facility, personnel walked down several flights of stairs, passing through the blast doors. The air was filtered to protect the people and equipment from nuclear fallout. The personnel inside would not be able to leave. These sites became obsolete in the early 1970s for two reasons. The targeting accuracy for nuclear weapons increased from two miles to within a few feet. Thus, the sites were all vulnerable to ground zero hits. 
Also, the use of fiber optic cables and equipment allowed for the greater path diversity in telecommunications. So even if multiple hardened facilities were targeted, telecommunication traffic could quickly be rerouted. By the 1990s, AT&T began selling off these obsolete sites. AT&T printed advertising brochures touting the unique benefits and security of these sites. Many are still sitting vacant and slowly decaying. They are becoming a haunting reminder of a time when the threat and fear of nuclear war gripped our nation.